Thank you. So when I first started my PhD, I wanted to do so in order to have conversations that would raise questions about our own contemporary ideas of rape, such as the one I'm about to have with you. This presentation involves the initial chapters of my thesis, which ultimately aimed to be a historical and cultural analysis of rape in the ancient Mediterranean world with a specific focus on Gnostic rape narratives. Gnostics, a group of early, early Christians who expressed their convictions through radical teachings, which held almost all the systems and religions of former times to be null and void. They deliberately taught radically different ideas from other religions to deconstruct the fundamental structure of what is known in Orthodox religions today. In order for me to do a Gnostic study on rape and to begin to change it, age old narratives on rape, it is essential for me to go back and map out rape narratives found in the Hebrew Bible. <clears throat> Claudia Card and her article, Rape as a Weapon of War, expresses, rape is an instrument of domestication. It breaks the spirit, humiliates, tames, produces a docile, deferential, obedient soul. Its immediate message to women and girls is that we will have in our own bodies only the control that we are granted by men. The legal definition of rape involves the non-consensual use of the sexual organs of another person's body. More specifically, the act of sexual intercourse with an individual without her consent through force or the threat of force. Included in this, not only is the use of sexual organs to penetrate the female, but the use of objects as penetrative devices. While there is no internationally accepted definition of rape that exists, for the purposes of this narrative and within my thesis, I will be referring to rape not only as a penetration of a female by a male without consent, but the forced prostitution and sexual slavery of women. Silence female voices in this case is not solely about the lack of women's physical voices, but their inability to be participants in their own lives. Like domesticated animals, women were not permitted an autonomous life, merely one that provided her family with the most power over her body and her sexuality. This brings me to the theme of this paper of how women's voices are silenced in biblical narratives and the subsequent male commentators, such as the early church fathers, that were used to replace their silenced voices. These narratives establish a path for future discourse and social cultures that force women to internalize ideas that leave them with a crushing conviction that they are now dishonored, worthless, damaged, and undesirable. <clears throat> and this is the part where how there's silence in the Hebrew Bible. In Genesis 34, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, ventures out into the village to explore the festivities and to meet women. Shechem, a Hivite prince, noticed her. He became lustful and he raped her. Shechem then decides he wants to marry Dinah and requests his father speak to Jacob, whom upon hearing his of his daughter's defilement says absolutely nothing, but grants the request. Begrudgingly, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's full brothers, grant Shechem's permission to marry Dinah. Simeon and Levi devise a plan to murder the men of the village, pillage, and kidnap the remaining women. In this regard, Dinah's subjectivity, along with her voice, go unheard. Her name only mentioned briefly, the reader is not expected to form any emotional attachment to her. Instead, she is viewed only as a character, an object meant to move the underlying narrative of a broader story along. In this case, a narrative of ethnic purity, with each tribe being instructed to keep their tribes pure or restrained from God. Dinah is absorbed into it a narrative that is designed to deny her any autonomy where her cries of protest go unnoticed. <clears throat> The unnamed concubine and the 600 kidnapped women. 
Judges 19 narrates the story of the Levite on his way back from retrieving his second wife or concubine from her father's home. On the journey back, the Levite, his wife, and male servant stop in the town of Jabia, a village of Benjaminites not known for its friendliness. With no place to stay, the three begin to bed down in a town square where an old man approaches them and offers his place for the night. Some time passes when a group of angry and drunken men demand the old man send out his male house guest so the group can rape him. To appease the drunken mob, the old man offers his own virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine. However, this does not satisfy the group. The Levite then seizes his wife, throws her out to the gang, who wantonly rape her and abuse her till morning. Upon waking to leave the next day, the Levite sees the body of his wife, lifeless. Assuming she's dead, he throws her on his horse and proceeds home, cuts her body into 12 pieces, and sends the pieces to the 12 tribes of Israel. A war ensues, resulting in the culmination of over 600 women being kidnapped and raped. The latter part of Judges provides the reader with no catharsis. Instead, we are met with beastliness and savagery, a testament to the violence women were forced to endure. Described by Gail Yee in her book, Judges and Method, the final section of Judges culminates in the most atrocious events. A wife is betrayed, gang raped, and dismembered, and 600 women are seized and raped to restock a near barren tribe. More than a narrative that provides nothing but abhorrent circumstances is the thought that the rape of one woman condones the rape of 600 others without any recourse. Instead, these men are revered for their efforts to rebuild the tribe of Benjaminites. <clears throat> Women and judges are strategically placed and used when they are needed, mainly as bodily replacements for men to, re to prevent the male body from being violated. The Levite's concubine is situated in this story as a placeholder, something that requires no words or even emotional attachments from the readers. Ultimately, this narrative emphasizes female helplessness and how rape aims to destroy women, even to the point of bodily annihilation. As with the 600 women who disappear in the interests of the greater good, their lives and their voices are forgotten to history. <clears throat> Commentators cannot understand their own religiosity without sex. Despite the piety of many of these writers and aversions to sexual intercourse, they are infatuated with it. Women are often the target of commentary, the object, the thing to be controlled among men, but they are never consulted. In fact, matters that dictate the, life of women, the lives of women do not concern them, yet they would be forced to, to live as if they did, including being responsible for male wantonness. This means that women not only were responsible for their own purity, but in keeping male lust at bay. An idea that many contemporary women can understand when accused of baiting men into raping them based solely on their dress or behavior in public. Orthodox writers such as St. Jerome, St. Augustine of Hippo, and Martin Luther sought to reaffirm the dominant androcentric culture of their time. This meant men and women both had strict sets of rules to follow as ordained by God. It was established early that women were the mothers of the home and that they should stay there. Women were encouraged by St. Jerome to stay indoors and well away from the windows in order to not be seen. Jerome uses Dinah's rape as a narrative as an example of what could happen should a woman be seen outside of the home. He warns women, go not from the home or visit daughters of a strange land, as Dinah went out and was ruined. Here, and for St. Jerome, Dinah is the cause of her own rape. And he uses this idea to keep women safely where he wants them, inside. 
Augustine undoubtedly one of the most influential commentators on sexual desires and sexual etiquette uses rape narratives <clears throat> to steer unwitting followers of God back onto the path of righteousness. He remarks in the city of God, when God exposes me to adversity, God is either testing my merits or chastising my sins. What Augustine is arguing here is that rape is God sent and therefore justifiable because of its purpose to serve a greater good, which ultimately is the point of salvation. Dinah's narrative warns other women that they should be, should they be inclined to sin, whether it be consciously or not, God will send his judgment in the form of prophylactic punishment. Martin Luther writes exclusively on Genesis 34 in his commentaries. He spends paragraph after paragraph deconstructing Dinah's age or for passing judgment that Dinah was around 12 years old, two years younger than proper Marian age, only due to the fact that she could not conceive a child. Martin Luther does not see the crime of rape as something done to Dinah, but her father, Jacob. A reminder that men controlled female sexuality. Luther describes, it th describes this as a sorrowful burden and a terrible disgrace. However, he does warn young women against having too much confidence in their security and with concerning themselves with life outside the home. As a result of his, her interests, Martin Luther wants young girls like Dinah with a propensity for curiosity to understand. They should not form the habit of strolling about and looking out the windows and lounging around the door, but should learn to stay home and never go anywhere else without permission. The punishment for her disobedience and girls like her is quite severe. They will be defiled by violence. In all these cases, there is no respite from violence for a woman in her life. She's constantly caught in the struggle of following the rules that she thinks that are meant to keep her safe, but only allow her to be controlled. More than the events that unfold in Judges is the lack of commentary from both Christian and Jewish authors, especially on the story of the dismembered concubine as it is so often associated with the story of Lot in Genesis 19, a similar narrative of offering women in the place of men to be raped. It would have been prudent for early church fathers to write on the story in Judges. However, this was not the case. Those who did provide commentary, such as Nicholas of Lyra and Dennis the Carthusian, chose to write on the unnatural intercourse of the rape in Judges. Very few commentators had little to add in favor of the women affected, with their focus being on the narrative of male-on-male -male rape. In addition to this, there were attempts to fix the story in Judges through a poetic license used by such authors as Josephus and, Bish and Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, Milan, to minimize the sting of responsibility associated with the Levite's action, providing insight to the church's uneasiness with sex designed for pleasure and not reproduction. It should come as no surprise that there are no references to men actually being raped in the Bible. However, what is clear is that there is an excessive female rape, ultimately pointing to why female rape is resoundingly preferred to male rape. Narratives such as this should be private. Instead, they are turned in politi into political motifs publicly displayed for the world to see. Augustine neglected to write any commentary on the rape and judges, but what he did too was provide a loophole that condones not only the actions of the drunken gang, but the Levite. As he writes in his last work, De Mendacio, but if he be drenched with filth, or if anything in a foul manner be forced upon him through the mouth, or if he be forced to submit like a woman, then the feelings of all are offended. And if he is called defiled and unclean, therefore it is concluded that no one should prevent by his own sin, for his own sake, or for the sake of another, any sin whatsoever of another person, 
except those sins which bring defilement to the person from violent from the vi from whom violence is perpetuated. Augustine here is stating that female bodies are designed with submissiveness in mind, bodies purpose to be defiled. Rape is a good experience, but only if you are a woman. Whatever the case may be, the male body needs to be protected against invading forces, namely other men. These rape narratives show that the victim's voice, women's voices, do not matter in the larger narrative of religion. The reader is not encouraged to feel sympathy towards women, nor view them as human. Instead, they become bodily replacements that do not need a voice, as their only function is to move early establishment stories forward, and more importantly, preserve male pride and dignity. With women's expendability being a dominant theme, this allows male counterparts to create stories that erase female experiences and silence their voices. Even, through andro even though androcentric culture is designed with the, the male narrative in mind, church fathers waste no time reiterating the importance of a docile and silent female. The tension early church fathers created in classifying male bodies as superior and deserving of protection over female bodies indicates the fragile framework in which these men felt they lived. This tension still exists as the culturally accepted view of rape, which aims to destroy women as a group, allows for men to get away with committing violent acts, violent acts against women. It is here that I aim to look at the Gnostic texts and begin to start a new conversation to help about female voices and women's autonomy. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kyla. I think you frozen slightly, so I'm not sure if you've been up this whole time. Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, that's not an easy topic. Um, to hear to um you know it's not quite easy on the ears but thank you um i think it's something that's becoming increasingly important to discuss um and i would like to say for any ken student watching if you have been affected or you do want to access any support please um access student support and well-being they are um open still over the summer for you um and if you do need to access any other support there is east kent rape crisis or if you're not a student at Kent or not in the Kent area, you can access Rape Crisis. Um, they have resources online, um, really helpful. But um, moving on to the question part of this. So we do have one question. If anyone else does want to put any more questions in, please feel free to put it in the live Q&A section now. Um, and hopefully the delay won't mean we miss any, but we'll start with the first one. Um, a long one. I'll just try to read it as slowly as I can for you, um, and then I'll publish it in case you want to read it, Kyla. So, given Judaism has this matril matrilineal <laughs> emphasis on the central, okay, the words here, okay. You want to publish um, it? <laughs> <laughs> I struggle to read sometimes. I'm sorry. I'll try again. So, emphasis on the centrality of needing a Jewish mother to transmit the faith and how this is echoed in the Old Testament. How does this work alongside women's silence and submission? So, I've published it for you, so sorry, I've stumbled on a few words there. How do I find it? <laughs> Just on the right where it says live event Q&A. Uh, okay. That's notes. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, Hold on. Just one on the left, it should be, and then publish those two, just me and then one from Anonymous. Um, I think the best way I could answer this is um, so given Judaism has this matrilineal emphasis on the centrality of needing a Jewish mother to transmit the faith and how this is echoed in the Old Testament, how does this work alongside women's silence and submission? Um, I, it depends on which like track of Judaism you're talking about. Um, but I think women in Jewish cultures work within the framework that they're taught. Um, it's not 
in and I'm not an expert in all Jewish religions uh, or tracks of religion, but I think they work within the framework that they're allowed to work in, where they find um, some bits and ways to have their own sense of sexuality and control, but it's still controlled by the larger narrative of what men dictate, um, where it's still very much run by patriarchal um, uh, say so and what is overall uh, dictated by um, doctrine that the males in the religion interpret is is what I would say um, to that um, mostly it, it, it is and it isn't so women are expected to sort of um, pass along this information and stuff to the daughters but you have to think where did that sort of information begin coming from and and it would be ultimately from a, a sort of patriarchal standpoint in society is what i would say sorry really weird <laughs>